Welcome everybody to this Truata virtual roundtable focusing around the key question, is privacy dead in a big data world? My name is Nadine DeRays and I'm really looking forward to hosting this session. Thank you very much for joining us wherever you are in the world today. So over the next hour, we're going to be discussing the very latest developments in the world of data privacy. And how this roundtable is going to work is that we'll have a panel discussion for around 40 minutes. And then the last 20 minutes, I'm going to open up the floor, the virtual floor to the media, to the journalists who have joined us. I'm pleased to say that we have an expert panel made up of four speakers today, two from Truata and two third party industry experts. And briefly, I'm going to introduce you to all four of them. Now, first of all, I'd like to welcome Aoife Sexton, who is Chief Privacy Officer at Truata. And when I was checking Aoife out, I know she's got another title as well. She's Chief of Product Innovation. Welcome, Aoife, to the round table. And I know privacy is the DNA of Truata. So briefly explain to uh, the audience, the journalists who've joined us, what your role entails, please. Ah, Aoife, you, you're on mute. So I'm the very first person to do that. So hopefully that's it, Nadine. You won't have to do that one again. There's always one. But anyway, thanks, Nadine. And uh, yeah, so my name is Aoife Sexton. I'm the Chief Privacy Officer here in Trust, and also, as you said, Head of uh, Product Innovation. So in terms of Chief Privacy Officer, I'm responsible for all things privacy as it relates to the organization. And in terms of the product innovation, really looking at the product roadmap and where Truata will innovate and bring privacy enhancing technologies to the market. So it's a dual role, but I suppose it shows that privacy is at the heart uh, of the DNA of Truata. Brilliant. Thank you very much for joining us. We like the backdrop, by the way. It is genuine. You are yes. in your office. It's not a fake one. And, and next up, we have Morris Coyle, the Chief Data Scientist at Truata, or should we say Dr. Morris Coyle? I think that's your <laughs> real title. Uh, and I know you've got a huge amount of experience when it comes to delivering improved experiences whilst respecting user privacy. Morris, tell us about your role. Thanks Nadine and welcome to everyone. So I'm the Chief Data Scientist in Truada. I have a really fun job because I get to solve problems and uh, talk to people. So I work closely with Aoife in, with both of her hats on. In fact, it, privacy and product are really important for my role to understand what we need to build. And then my team builds the algorithms and the prototypes that we then implement as part of our products so that we can deliver these privacy enhanced analytic solutions to our customers. Well, good to have you here with us um, this afternoon. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Yokiko Lorenzo, who's the Senior Managing Consul for Privacy and Data Protection at MasterCard. Uh, thank you very much, Yokiko. I know we were expecting another colleague, but we're delighted that you could join us. And you're like me, you're in the garden, which is disguised <laughs> as an office. Um, so it's great to have you here. What is the remit and role and responsibility that you currently undertake? Thanks, Danine, and thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Yukiko Lorenzo. I'm part of uh, Mastercard's privacy and data protection team, which is about 30 strong teams. So you can see how privacy is very important for Mastercard. Um, I lead a European privacy team, as well as supporting our analytics business and humanitarian development team. So Indeed. Very, very uh, I know you've got a huge amount of international experience as well, but at the moment you're focusing on Europe, but maybe you could bring that international expertise to the fore as well throughout today. And last but not least, uh, Jules uh, Polonetsky, CEO of the Future Privacy Forum, which is a Washington DC based nonprofit organization that serves, I think as a catalyst, if I'm right, for privacy leadership and scholarship. So how so, how does that work, Jules? And welcome to the show. Thanks, delighted to be with you all. We work with the senior privacy people of the world. And that means chief privacy officers of companies, large and small. It means data protection regulators. It means academics who are studying and worrying about the impacts of data on the world, civil society. And at the end of the day, we're optimistic. We think they're incredibly valuable things that can be done with tech and data. 
but we also see all the harms and all the problems. And so we work to try to come up with pragmatic solutions with all of these stakeholders in Brussels, in Washington, in the Middle East, in Brazil, uh, as privacy is being regulated and debated around the world, we try to help chart a reasonable path forward. Brilliant. Great to have you here. And I've read your biography and you've got vast experience within the industry, as do all our panellists. So thank you very much for your involvement. Let's start with that overarching question. Is privacy dead in the world of big data? Now, Aoife, microphone ready, I hope. Let's get your take on this. Yeah, no, it is turned on. Um, yeah, what a question. And for me, I think it couldn't be further from the truth. I think privacy is alive and well. Um, and, and there's a couple of reasons why I say that. I think firstly, it's the emergence of modern privacy and data protection laws around the world. And many of them, in fact, take inspiration from the EU's general data protection regulation. Um, Gartner itself predicted that by the end of 2023, 80% of companies around the world will be regulated by at least one privacy law. And I think not only are companies um, seeing even more laws, I think they're even seeing an increase in the obligation being placed on those companies. So even if we look at California and we take it as an example, it passed the California Consumer Privacy Act. And it's only been in operation a number of months and already there's an initiative to augment that law and to increase and clarify the rights of Californian citizens. Um, secondly, uh, balancing against that are the fact that consumers have more rights and they're more aware of their rights. Um, what's interesting throughout is we did a survey uh, last year called the Global Consumer State of Mind Survey, where an independent research company uh, interviewed over 8,000 individuals across the UK, France, India and the US, really to find out about their attitudes about businesses using their personal data. And a couple of things really, you know, uh, jumped out in terms of the results of that survey. The first was that consumers care deeply about privacy. And the second was that they would like to be more in control of their data. And I base that uh, on the fact that over 77% of global consumers agree that data privacy is essential to them. And this is backed up by the fact that they are willing to take action in this regard as 78% of global consumers have taken one or more steps to reduce their digital footprint. In addition, about 63% of the consumers agree that they would stop buying or using brands if those brands didn't demonstrate that they care about being responsible with their personal data. And on the control side, consumers said, about 77% of them said that they would like to own their digital selves. So, I think, you know, far from privacy being dead, privacy is alive and well. And I think companies would be well advised to take data protection and privacy seriously as an issue because, um, you know, it will affect their bottom line and in particular their ability to attract and retain their valuable customers. Absolutely. And I actually had a look at the uh, State of the Mind report as well. And it's quite interesting to see that personalization paradox that how do people feel about that digital behavior? And they found at least four in 10 global respondents found data tracking to be very evasive. Um, evasive, creepy were the two key findings. So it, there are lots of really interesting findings from this report. It's a wake up call, really, isn't it? If people haven't woken up to this information already, then they will certainly do so over the coming months. And I think it sends a clear message, as one of your contributors said, that brands need to proactively embrace the spirit of the law. I think you'd say, Aoife. Uh, Yokiko, what's your thoughts on this question? I, I agree with Aoife. I think privacy is live and actually kicking. And uh, uh, as you can see, the, all the people here in this webinar, uh, it's quite a strong, I mean, it's growing sort of uh, in an area. Uh, and then as a profession, uh, it, it has grown so much. So that's even an indication that privacy is really live and kicking. Um, I have to say that big data privacy, they're not zero sum game. It's really about embracing big data with privacy in mind, and it doesn't have to be uh, one way or another. Um, and I think it's really about increasing transparency, letting people know how the data is used in a bit more intuitive way, 
not this sort of long legal text, but really a bit more intuitive, so on something that reasonably expected, uh, or give them a bit more control over how their data is used. So really, all these contribute to trust. And I think we're now looking at not looking at just the text of the law, but doing a bit more than the legal compliance on privacy. And I think this trend has uh, increased more with the COVID-19 and pandemic, where you may have more public interest to sort of you know, track to trace who may have uh, infection, but then balancing with the privacy rights. So I think it's, it's much more prominent, uh, I think, as a result of pandemic. Indeed, I mean, you see those digital footprints increase dramatically, haven't you? And again, I know MasterCard have done several surveys into this too, which are well worth reading up again um, afterwards if you haven't done so already. Uh, just a quick comment, Morris and Jules, maybe, just conscious of time. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, first? Uh, from, a, from a tech and a data point of view, I'd certainly agree that rather than being dead, privacy is almost only a beginning um, because technologies that are coming out of the lab now and are being applied in commercial settings are really coming to the fore. And I think it, the, the the imperative for privacy is that it must evolve as big data evolves. So pipelines and work uh, work uh, processing material uh, processing technologies for big data, they're they need to be kept kept up with white privacy as well. So there's a lot of really interesting innovation and research going on. Jules, quick comment. Yeah, I'll add just this because I think you know if a average consumer you know was listening to us, they'd say, but what do you mean all these new ways that data is being collected and tracked, I feel like privacy is dead, right? And they do have a point in that we are, uh, you know, because of the pandemic, because of all the digital tools we use, because of all the new social media, you know, clearly it's easy to say, wait a second, we're oozing and leaking more information to more people and more companies than ever before. And so, you know, when we look at it like that, it can e it can be easy to say, well, privacy seems to be dead. But I think what you heard from um, uh, my colleagues here is, are we rushing to put the rules in place? Because most of us don't want to actually be hermits and we don't want to live on a desert island, right? We, we want to connect with other humans and we even want products and services. But what we don't want is all of the negative things that we know can happen. We want to know if we buy something, we get a product. And that doesn't mean everyone else sells it, right? And that if we interact with some friends on social media, on some digital tool, that marketers or uh, criminals or so forth don't have it. So privacy is definitely under stress, but I think the data protection tools that are becoming more sophisticated and the notion that privacy is a human right that's not a trivial thing that's not just about cookie banners and pop-ups that's about actually recognizing that this data even if it's moving has integrity is about humans needs to be protected by law and by policies and people care more about that than ever today than ever before Oh, I can sense that passion in you, Jules. Thank you very much. And you haven't even done a full day yet. So uh, looking forward to the subsequent questions. Let's move on to a question about data for societal good, just building on some of the comments you've said already. So how do you balance the societal good that can be achieved with data analysis alongside an individual's right to privacy? Um, we've already mentioned about the developments in COVID-19, maybe the track and trace program springs to mind or, or medical research or contact tracing in general. Uh, Jules, um, I'm going to start with you. Well, first of all, you don't get to do it just because you decide that it's socially good. My business does useful things. So therefore, you know, it's legitimate. My research <laughs> is uh, a good idea because I think it's going to help society. It's a serious process, right? First, we need to actually understand that this is actually going to be effective, right? Scanning crowds with giant thermal sensors, if the experts debate whether this is effective, then you don't have perhaps a strong data protection argument to say that it's good, it's useful. So is it effective? Is what you're doing proportional? Is it reasonable? Is it balanced? These are all concepts that are already built in, frankly, to GDPR and to laws around the world. So societal benefit, is a strong argument. It puts you in the room, but you still need to show that you're not going to keep the data forever, that you're putting minimization and de-identification controls about it, that the stakeholders whose data it is understand and see and would agree with you that there is benefit. So you don't just get to say it's data for good and then privacy doesn't apply. It starts the conversation 
And if you appropriately balance and have the rules and rights and technology, then we're in a serious societal good position. Indeed, and, and more ethical issues happen as a result of it. You need to ensure that what when you say societal good, you appreciate that there are some critics, some risks that are downsides, and you need to show that you've taken care of those so that it actually is ethically something that is of beneficial value to the community. Thank you. Morris. Yeah, and I think really a good example is the global pandemic that's ongoing at the moment. There's been an understandable rush to use data and technology to manage the pandemic. Um, I, there's a couple of things that we need to consider though uh, when doing that. There's undoubted social good in you know preventing the spread and, and um, saving lives using data and technology. We have to consider that there are privacy and ethical considerations at play. Um, for one, the pandemic will pass. And so any privacy, any data or analytics programs that have been made available, if there are not adequate safeguards in place, then they represent a future privacy risk, even from a regulatory point of view. But also the fact that um, we, we don't have to, it doesn't have to be an either or. So privacy and social good don't have to be in conflict with each other if effective privacy or data protection by design is used. And, and then I suppose really importantly, if if privacy and ethical considerations are made in advance, it can actually improve the value and the ability of these analytics and this, these data programs to affect change. For a start, if it's well recognized that data is being collected and processed in a way that's both ethical and has privacy at its heart, then these programs will be accepted by the public. You get greater buy-in and quite often you'll find that the results in the data as a result are much richer. Um, it's also quite interesting to note that when you're talking about machine learning in particular, there's a lot of prediction going on with regards to data available. Um, machine learning can actually be improved by considering privacy and ethical implications up front. It turns out that uh, the machine learning models that have most privacy risk are typically ones that are overfit. The ones that have individual decision paths relating to people, uh, to, to individual people, they are the ones that contain most re-identification risk. So spending the time to think about privacy upfront means that the data scientist at the very least understands where their models or where their an analysis might be overfitting. And then finally, I think it's really important that we don't forget the science part. You know, data science has rigorous methodologies that should be used and you can't ignore them. You can't necessarily fast track them uh, in the, even in the face of a, a global pandemic, you, because if you do that, then the results and the outputs that are produced, they can actually reduce, they can result in social harm because you can cause panic. You can give people a false sense of security. So I think really being sure to, to knuckle down and, 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 and approach these things mindfully is very important as well. Yokiko, I can see you nodding away to some of Morris's <laughs> comments. Uh, your thoughts, please, on this. I absolutely agree with both Morris and, and Jules. And I thought I can give you probably three examples uh, that we can sort of balance both social good and privacy. Um, so, I mean, this is really the theme of what I say. It's not zero sum game. It, it's about the balance. Um, so the first example is um, we have a website called Shop Openings. Um, so when the lockdown was gradually easing uh, in the different parts of the world, uh, we thought that it would be very helpful to let consumers know which shops are actually open so they feel they can you know, organize uh, their visit, etc. We've also sort of provided insights to which stores might be really busy at what time so people can organize to see if they can visit time when it's not really crowded. So there are things we can do with the data without using identifiable information, but provide these kind of insight to help sort of people's lives. Um, another thing is, I mean, that was more consumer oriented, uh, but another thing is obviously many smaller, medium sized enterprises are really suffering as a result of a strict lockdown. So, you know, is there any way we can provide them with insight uh, on economic recovery? You know, what are the trends so they can reflect that in the operations strategy for the recovery plan as well? So that's another thing. Um, another example is tourism industry has been hit quite hard with this lockdown and restrictions. 
restrictions. So maybe we can provide insights using the past experiences, past patterns to see from which country what tourists tend to like um, and, and you know what kind of trends we have seen before so they can sort of develop the strategy for recovery. Um, all these can be achieved through aggregate anonymized data sets. And uh, as I said, this is really examples of how we can balance sort of social good and people's privacy. And we've particularly seen that shift to digital. Again, I know there's a MasterCard Recovery Insights report I've got here. When you've seen just say, for example, in the United States, um, during April and May, e-commerce sales doubled and they were 22% of all retail sales. So having those kind of insights will help, you said, operations, supply chains plan better. So it's clever use of data. OK, thank you very much. Let's move on again. Another question. I said it'd be quite fast paced. Um, let's look at data privacy for now and in the future. And since the introduction of data regulations such as GDPR, which I think was May 2018, and then CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which was shortly after GDPR, but the same year, have companies changed in how they approach big data and analytics? So have they become more cautious or is it business as usual? I'm going to give that one to Aoife. Yeah, I think it's kind of hard to answer that as a, as a one size fits all. Um, I think you know one of the most uh, prominent things we've seen since the, the the regulations have come into play is the fact that it forced companies, many for the first time, to do a proper data audit and an in inventory and really figure out what data they actually had, how they collected it, what were they using it for, where they stored it, etc. And I think also it really created an awareness of privacy in a way that didn't exist before in that it may have been perceived by many organizations, data protection as sort of a back office compliance uh, you know, function, whereas it was elevated suddenly to becoming much more of a board strategic issue and really forced companies, many for the first time, to understand what was going to be their big data strategy and how they would align that with their mm -hmm. privacy strategy as well. But in terms of, you know, how companies have approached this, I think there is probably a divergence amongst companies when we look at companies that are in regulated sectors versus non-regulated sectors. Um, so I'm talking about finance and telco and other insurance type industries. And I think one of the main reasons for that is they already had a culture of uh, compliance embedded in their organization. So they understood more readily that data was a regulated asset and how could they use this asset for things like analytics, etc. Whereas um, I think they also understood that the stakes were high and if they got it wrong, they weren't, not, they weren't only just looking at regulatory fines, but they were also looking potentially at reputational damage, brand damage, shareholder lack of confidence in the leadership and also potentially um, their share price as well being affected. Whereas I think non-regulated businesses that haven't had that same level of culture embedded in their organization perhaps have looked at uh, data and use of data in a slightly different way, maybe looking at it from a, a more risk-based approach and, and perhaps haven't fully grasped that that data is a regulated asset and it can't be used any which way. And I think the reason I mentioned that is because when you use data for something like analytics, it's a, it's a secondary use of data. And I think many companies have struggled um, with understanding how they can use data in that way. And there's been a certain amount of paralysis around business use cases with data. Um, but I think there's, there's a, a growing level of confidence now and awareness amongst companies about how they might use big data. And I think companies like Truata are there to try and help them and bring some privacy enhancing technologies to the table to kind of instill more confidence in these companies about the data that they have, what is the sort of personal data within these data sets and how they can safely use that data. You know, Yukiko mentioned, um, you know, it's possible to get uh, incredibly valuable insights from data even when it's not identifiable data. So privacy enhancing technologies like anonymization and pseudonymization, um, I think are starting to be embraced as ways for companies to kind of navigate this desire they have to use big data, but to use it in a way which is responsible, um, but also as a way of uh, ensuring compliance. But I suppose in many ways, the, the global privacy framework is like to become even more complicated, isn't it, Aoife? Because one size doesn't fit all. 
You yes. can see there isn't a global standard. There's nuances. We've got some um, regulatory bodies about to introduce, and then obviously the pandemic happened. So certain countries can put in place some of the laws and legislation. So how do companies sort of navigate that? Because it sounds incredibly complicated, particularly if you've got a global footprint. Aoife, did you want to make another comment on that? Or I'm quite happy for somebody else to jump in. I think probably some others would probably jump in on that one quite readily. Yeah. Jules? It, it has become enormously complicated. When I became a chief privacy officer 20 years ago, um, I had a team which was large by those standards of six or seven. And um, today, if you're doing business globally, and by the way, that's not just a large company like a, uh, a MasterCard. Any app developer who's in the app store with the flip of a switch makes their app available in countries around the world. And they are now subject to the new law that just passed in Brazil. They need to be getting ready for the new law that is being negotiated in India. They've got to deal with all, what are becoming dozens of state laws in the US. People probably are aware uh, if they do business globally of the California Consumer Privacy Act, but we've got biometrics acts and we have data breach acts and we have sector specific legislation and Canada is in the middle of updating its legislation and Quebec in specific is updating. It's become complicated. Um, it's become technical because you need to understand AR or uh, augmented reality. You need to understand the latest thing that's happening with cookies and tracking. Everyone is doing machine learning. So to actually keep up, I will tell you our organization, which doesn't lobby, which doesn't, we just actually try to help people understand and think through what is the identification? What are the best techniques? Who are the vendors to work with? What are the um, different definitions? It's become so incredibly complicated that we've been growing almost 20% a year, just bringing people together to sort of puzzle these things out. And that's with people who, with, with outside councils and law firms. So it's become a very highly regulated. People used to joke and say data is like oil. No, oil, you got to hire environmental experts. It's like plutonium, right? You need to have careful and sophisticated data about it uh, and, and careful and sophisticated legal and technology controls. So. I, I fear for the innovators and those new startups. You can't just launch things anymore. Now, maybe that's not a bad thing, right? We had people launch things and they were little innovators. They were startups, but they had 100 million people, right? And they had access to like everything on your phone. So maybe it was a little too easy, right? But I do think we want to preserve the opportunity for, you know, somebody with a great idea. Um, my, my teens are um, like many doing their school online. And people use, you know, Quizlet, a little program that just helps you make like flashcards and that sort of thing. It was started by a 16 year old who needed a better way to, you know, share his study cards with his friends. Right. And it's become, you know, a sizable, important company. So I don't think we want to stifle that. So we need to figure out how to make this easier for them, how to give them on ramps. And part of that is by actually building this into the technology so that I can actually I, I don't want to become a data protection lawyer. I simply want to build an app in a way that is going to be respectful. So build it in for me. Give me the tools so that I understand that most of the challenges will be managed and shaped for me. Indeed, I think respectful is an incredibly important point. Morris, I'm going to bring you in here, just move it along. Um, what are the key issues in your view that companies are facing when it comes to data privacy today and also looking into the future? Yeah, I mean, one question that we frequently encounter is, have we done enough? I think that's a really tough question for companies to answer, and it, it creates a lot of you know, fear and, and paralysis quite often in terms of what they can do and not do with their data. And in truth, I suppose the, the answer to that question is that privacy is never done as such. You're never, you know, all you can do is really embed privacy considerations into your company. And so privacy is more like a process, an ongoing process that has to be built into existing platforms, existing processes, but also into the people. So you have to engender into the, a mindset and a DNA of privacy thinking into a company. And again, that's probably the second uh, biggest issue is, is trying to do that. You know, trying to get people to change their behavior and think about both privacy and growth or analytic utility is really hard to do. Um, but, and again, that's why 
privacy by design as a as an approach and data protection by design is is designed to do that when done right you don't have to have large scale training and inductions well you, you typically train your your employees but you can have confidence that your systems and processes have privacy baked into them so that's really important and then i suppose another one is exactly is is balancing that privacy those privacy and business growth considerations quite often it can be a trade off you do sometimes trade off analytic utility for instance with um with privacy and typically under the data protection regulations risk based decisions are how people approach it and how people comply well you can't you can't make a risk based decision unless you understand the risks and quite often these risk assessments are done subjectively they're done as a desk based survey and so there's a really need, real need for objectively finding the risks in your data sets so, so you can make a risk based decision that's really important and then i suppose you know the 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 potential counterpoint to uh, privacy enhancing technologies being uh, having a, a, a coming to the fore in recent times is that there's a lot of myths surrounding them. So quite often they can be seen as a silver bullet or they can be used in ways that inadvertently leave companies exposed to regulatory scrutiny or privacy breaches. And so understanding what is a fast growing landscape of privacy enhancing technologies, understanding which to use and in what configurations that can be quite a challenge for companies and to ensure that they achieve privacy protection while not compromising on that trust and the respect of their users. Jules, would you like to come in on this as well? You know, I, I love the here and the mention of privacy by design for two reasons. One, obviously, it's already built into law in 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 Europe and, you know, it obviously means put the technology in place so that the defaults and the logic do what you want to do with the data and do not do the types of things that could be a violation. But I'd like to take another spin on privacy by design, and that's moving this away from privacy policies and moving this away from um, legal and even from privacy, because you know most of us are too busy to do all these little things every day um, we know we should, but we're busy and we don't have the time and we don't want to read and we don't want to bother. But the reality is most of these um, issues increasingly are features. I like to talk about featuring data use. Like, I mean, let's take location. Um, people don't sit down and think, what's the real effect on my autonomy and my civil liberties in my location? They want to know what, what, what's going to happen. Is some stranger going to know, you know that I'm not home? Or who are you and what's this company going to do with it? Is this going to be like for your marketing? Maybe I want it, maybe I don't want it. But is this going to help me navigate, you know, and find uh, a business near me? Is this going to help me do mapping? And so I encourage uh, companies to featureize data use because when consumers look at it, they say, well, do I want this setting on or off? They get that, right? It's almost like driving a car where we have these complicated dashboards but we learn how to navigate and it's very risky, right? You could get into an accident, uh, all kinds of bad things can happen, but we learn to navigate you know, the roads um, and to use the features and know what the warning lights are like. And that's what our user interfaces need to do because this is what we're navigating now. We're navigating this sort of digital you know, system and the more we can featureize it, people will feel it'll be intuitive to them and they'll make decisions to flip these things on and off in a way that we'd like them to instead of saying you didn't check the settings sorry that all your data went to this place uh, you should have you should have looked at the settings if you really cared you would we need to featureize it avoid dark patterns so that i've somehow slipped into some flow and then i'm surprised that i'm being billed or i'm surprised that ads are tracking me or you know or that somehow i've sort of fallen into some abyss featureize the data use and design for privacy, design for the user experience, and data is increasingly very much part of that experience. Rather than having 100 pages of T's and C's that you don't know what you're signing up to. Okay, okay, let's move on. Uh, trust is incredibly important, isn't it? And arguably the key, one would say, to success. So let's have, spend some time talking about trust in privacy. So what demands do you think the consumers of the future will make regarding the processing and collection of their data. I'm going to bring in Aoife and Yakiko on this. So Aoife, to you first of all. 
Well, I, I certainly would agree with everything Jules said there about featureizing, and, and I think that's back to the issue of transparency, which we were all talking about. I think, I think also interesting. I think we are going to see the increased emergence of what we call privacy actives. Those those consumers who are going to choose brands and leave brands based on how they think those brands are using their personal data. And in many ways, there are parallels to how consumer behavior has emerged in the last decade. So you can look to examples of how consumers in certain instances had conviction based buying. So perhaps they were looking at organic products or cruelty free cosmetics or fair trade. And very much today, particularly with COVID and online shopping, I think lots and lots of uh, consumers are also looking to companies and their environmental footprint. And I was just reading an article today in one of the Irish newspapers talking, and it was a survey um, about shoppers, online shoppers. And one in three said that they would change um, their purchasing behavior if they discovered that a company's packaging wasn't environmentally friendly. So I think in the same way, um, consumers are looking to companies to demonstrate how they're using their data and how, you know, as you mentioned earlier, this this sort of creepy effect that some consumers feel in terms of how they're, they, they perceive they're being stalked, etc. So I think there's a huge opportunity here for companies to differentiate based on a privacy strategy and on a privacy first product. Um, and I think we've all touched upon this issue of transparency. I think there's no question that consumers want more transparency in a meaningful way. And we've all mentioned the long privacy policies and the legalese. And as Jules said, look, a lot of these are convenience products. We just don't have the time to read them. So I think they're going to look for much more of a show and tell and you know visualization about how their data is actually being used. Um, and I think, you know, over time, we're going to see consumers start to better understand the value exchange. So in return for me giving you my data, what value do I get in return? I think you're going to start seeing a bit more of an emergence of that. And also, I think with the shakeup that's likely to happen in ad tech and marketing, I think businesses are going to have to rely more on first party data. So, so what does that mean for them? It means that they need to build up relationships over time with their customers so that they can ensure that those customers are willing to over a long term give them data so that they can use this data to improve their products and services so so those are some of the things that i think we're going to see emerging uh which has started now but will probably continue on into the future thank you very much for that and yakiko i'd like to get your thoughts on this too Sure. Um, I think I mentioned earlier as well that obviously privacy, security, transparency and controls, these are really important tenets uh, of, of actually contributing to the trust. Um, but MasterCard um, actually went, decided to go a little bit beyond that and we, we came up with data responsibility principles or imperatives. And if you look at those uh, imperatives, we have two sort of um, principles. One is so making sure that companies continue to ensure individual benefits from the use of the data so that they can have better experience. So that's I think that's really important so that you have a trust in organization that they're innovating to make sure that they have better experience. Another principle is social impact. Uh, identifying needs and opportunities to make a positive impact on society. Uh, sorry, I, I think there's a bit of an echo. Is that me? Apologies. We, we luckily you froze just a little bit, but the voice has kept going. So fortunately, okay. let's hang on in there. If anybody's in your garden doing some lawn mowing, tell them to stop now. <laughs> so you've got a very stop. important global broadcast. Right. Uh, was there anything so, else to add as well? Sorry? Did you want to add something else then? You look like you're no, about no, to say something else. That um, um, going beyond sort of, you know, the traditional privacy requirements and then looking at innovation and social impact. Uh, and then I think that's really important uh, for consumers to sort of begin to you know, build trust in organisations and how they handle data. Thank you very much. OK, we've got a couple more questions before I open up to the floor. And uh, the next question is we've seen companies take a tick box approach, haven't we, to privacy or some companies anyway, to achieve compliance. But there are more far reaching benefits of embedding a culture of privacy awareness within an organisation. So 
are there, I've said that as a statement, so do you agree with that statement? Are there far-reaching benefits of embedding a culture of privacy awareness within an organisation? And Morris, if I can bring you in first. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, I, I, I mean, a tick box approach I don't think serves anyone particularly well. Uh, certainly when privacy and privacy by design are baked into a company, it means that they have greater confidence and flexibility in how they do their, how they approach their data driven side of their business today, but also into the future. If you know that you've baked privacy into these processes and technologies, then you know that future analytics initiatives are more likely to be possible and you just have a greater confidence across your organization. And I think where you have these different functions where you might have a data governance function and an analytics function, there needs to be effective dialogue across those those two functions because their incentives may not be aligned. And so I think equipping these functions to have productive dialogue is really important. Um, and doing that so by baking privacy into, into a company is, helps that to happen because both sets of teams are, are they understand how each other think. Um, and I, I suppose I don't need to reiterate all the points around customer trust positive brand recognition and most importantly probably employee loyalty because you, you'll see that a lot of companies around uh, some of the companies that have been involved in high profile data breaches they experience walkouts they experience activism from within their company and it really doesn't serve the, the functioning of their organization very well when their employees are speaking out against their privacy practice so i think that is a, a sort of a rot that can set into a company um, and and it, it's really hard to to get rid of it so i think you know it's it's simply good business to take privacy seriously because it, it affects not just how your customers see you but how your employees see the company they work for, how they identify with it, and then also how they work together. Jules, please, your thoughts. Uh, so look, we've all been experiencing these um, cookie pop-ups that um, somehow uh, are uh, supposed to make us all feel that we've got more data protection, more privacy. And I think it's an example of sort of this mismatch, right? Business models have been built doing analytics in a certain way, doing advertising in a certain way. And we don't want to take on the debate of do we actually think at the end of the day, this is the appropriate sort of trade off. And so we add requirements and the companies that are in that space either want to go away or they can comply with tick boxes and then the tick boxes aren't good enough. So we make sure that the tick boxes are bigger and better and we're adding more tick boxes. Uh, soon you might be asking uh, and getting another tick box. Do you agree that your data will go from Europe to the US because of the recent court decisions? And that somehow will protect everyone's privacy and consumers think it's a big joke. So what? Um, how, how is whether I, if this is a human right and it's actually protected by serious law, how can whether or not I ticked or unticked the little box and then I don't even see anything happen differently? Like all I know is I'm still seeing ads and I don't really know what's happening in the background. So look, this is where regulators need to have a bigger, broader picture and actually have more influence on society and sort of sort of sitting back and saying, look, we're independent and that's what the law says. So you can comply with it by having these different, you know, legal uh, things. Uh, we have regulators who say, we don't like long privacy policies, but by the way, here are the 85 things that you must disclose in detail using this specific wording and this specific language in the privacy in your, in your data protection policy, or you've somehow violated the law. So we're, we're, we're heading for a, cl a clash here. Data use is getting more complicated, more sophisticated, machine learning, deeper and more complicated analytics. And we're still struggling with how do we force companies to truly engage users? And you know what the answer is? Let's decide what's right and what's wrong. If it's wrong, you restrict it and you put the right protections on it. If it's truly optional, you make sure that it's an optional part of settings. If it's something that's about marketing, right? We're avoiding the real debate, which is that there's huge risk, there's huge benefit, and we need a much more smooth and simple system. You know what I see happening? 
The browsers are jumping in to make the decisions for us. The platforms are jumping in to make the decisions for us. Is that the ideal place? Should the platform, should Apple and Google and Facebook and so forth be the first word and the last word? They certainly should be doing their part and we want them managing their responsibilities. But uh, we see people building AI agents that will start adjusting your controls you know, for you. So what are we gonna have? The company's machine learning against my AI agent having a little battle for my data in the background, right? That makes no sense. So we we need to develop paths forward where we can have sophisticated uh, data use, but strong ironclad guarantees without forcing the consumer to be boxing and ticking and unticking. It's untenable. Yes, a simple system. Sounds like we need a global standard. How likely is that going to happen? That's global for another time, I think. <laughs> OK, final question before I open up to the other journalists. I think really this discussion has highlighted that privacy is far from dead, hasn't it? So as the value that can be extracted from data continues to grow, moving forward, how do we maintain that balance between using data and respecting the rights of the individual? I know we've sort of come across these um, ideas already throughout the virtual roundtable, but just want to look for some closing statements from you. And uh, first of all, I'm going to go to Yokiko. Yes, thanks, Nadine. I think there have been so many good sort of discussions today, and um, they are, as I said, you know, good examples. Uh, some companies have very good practices on how to balance the sort of use of data and privacy. And as I said, once again, I you know, reiterate, it's not a zero-sum game. It's about balance and then make that balance right. So, very good. Thank you for short to the point. I like it. Jules, the holy it's grail at the end quick. of the day, the holy grail at the end of the day is using technology to guarantee these uh, protections, using law to guarantee these protections. One of the reasons why I love working uh, and, and learning from the folks at Torada is it's, it is a model example. There are others as well, and it takes some of the burden off consumers. If we can say, actually, there's a legal protection there, there's a technology protection there, um, there's an ethical review. I, I want to offload this from the individual consumer and leverage technology to solve the problem as much as feasible. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, I'll get a comment. Morris, do you want to say anything quickly or should I go to um, Aoife? Uh, well, I suppose it really it's, it's about considering both sides, you know, in terms of understanding what is what you're trying to achieve, both from an analytic and a privacy point of view and, and understanding how they interact with each other. But that's you can only do that by looking at both uh, topics very closely. Aoife, final words to you before we Yeah, I suppose up. It's, it's a real issue for consumers. So for businesses, it's all to play for. You know, our survey showed that 66% of consumers are more likely to stay with a brand if they feel that that company is using their personal data in a responsible way. And on the flip side, 63% said that they would stop buying from brands if they don't demonstrate they care about it. So, I mean, I think Jules has pointed out some of the complexity here. This isn't simple stuff. It's not easy for companies, but I think they could look to embrace some of the newer technologies that are coming on the market. And one of the things we say in Truada is why use personal data when you don't have to? You know, if you can derive trends from non-personal data, why wouldn't you use that? So it's starting to look at data a bit differently and looking at the defaults and looking at, you know, how you can still innovate innovate but still balance that responsibility yeah innovate and balance responsibility i like that well let's thank you very much to our four panelists so far you're not off the hook yet though because we're going to open up the floor to uh, our journalists who've joined us to see if they have any questions for you so um aaron i know we had some journalists join us who have we got um in our in our virtual round table with us i can we just see names Jenny from Silicon Republic there, and we also have Ellen as well from, from Verdict. Lovely. So Jenny and Ellen, welcome to you. Who wants to ask a question first? Shall I make the decision? <laughs> Jenny, do, do you have any questions? Can, have you got your microphone on? I do, yeah. Hi, guys. Um, really interesting session. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. I just want to ask um, a little bit more about sort of data scientists and what their role is in terms of kind of mining and monitoring this privacy, because it used to be more to do with specifically the IT team. And now as data scientists continue to 
deal with all this data, how well educated or prepared do you think they are to deal with the ethics of that? Well, I suppose from the very start, uh, the goal of data science has been to you know, produce outputs that have either predictive power or that accurately reflect a certain, uh, like a, a, an aspect of a business. Um, like there's, it's a really burgeoning field at the moment, trying to understand what the privacy implications are of various analytic processes. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, quite a lot of the, the kind of the, the core of doing good data science is also has a, a, a very close analog in privacy, because if you have a model that doesn't generalize well, where it, it's, it's very tightly overfit or it reflects the data too closely, um, then it does, while it's, it's not going to be as accurate or as, as high performing, it also has quite a lot of privacy risk. So it, it is a real, a real, there is a real need for data scientists to be aware of the privacy risks and also the facts that there are the biases that are reflected in the data, they can affect vulnerable populations when these models are deployed. And there is a need for data scientists to take those aspects and, and understand them and, and bake them into their, their uh, professional practices. But as I say, it's not that they have to do that at the expense of quality. It's something that really does help the overall understanding of the data and of the model itself so that they can drive, make much better business decisions as a result. Yes. yes, I'd like to add to more is that so I, I mentioned that I support our analytics business at MasterCard and my friends are data scientists. Um, they love speaking with me. Uh, I don't know why. Um, but I think they find it like intellectual challenge to make sure that what they're creating are also meeting the privacy sort of you know standards and expectation of the people so there's a lot of going back and forth back and forth and hey you know this seems to be compliant but this is this the right thing to do so you know talking um morris talked about bias how will this have an impact on certain community so we need to really think through that and i think um some organizations and data scientists uh they're really now more ingrained into thinking about people and privacy so i just wanted to add that yeah and, and jenny has that answered your question because i know silicon republic i've got some notes here targets technology professionals include those studying science technology engineering and maths so is there anything else that you want to ask in addition has that answered your question no that's perfect that's answered my question thank you Nathan, so, I'd, thank I'd, you jenny. I'd, I'd add briefly though i do think there's a gap in the market in the kind of education that yeah. data scientists need because they're not looking to sign up for a course on GDPR and they'd look at some of it and they'd say, well, wait a second, uh, I shouldn't be transferring data to the US unless I can guarantee that it's not available to the NSA. Well, my brain's going to melt down because how do I know? How, wh what do you mean? And you say, well, we, we have these contracts that will do it. And they say, wait, how is a contract going to keep the NSA from getting the data? Well, the regulators are, are thinking it through and they're going to tell us what the safeguards are but we should be already thinking about what they are and start putting them in place but we're not going to have guidance yet their brains would melt down there's there's a real need for you know tech savvy pragmatic information that today you can't just pick up you know the gdpr and give it to a data science and say here follow these rules they're like well what's my you know product requirements here so th there does need to be some more work sort of gapping the legal layer to what it actually means when it comes to network and what it comes to databases and when it comes to systems and um, not enough people who are really uh, fluent in both of those worlds. I mean, I yeah, so I think it's a super question. I think those of us who work in sort of tech and data, even as lawyers, you know, we're just so aware of uh, uh, this gap. Uh, particularly when it comes back to um, just you know the, the education of those who are coming out who are going to be working with big data computer scientists the data scientists but also the lawyers and you know how we need this hybrid we need privacy engineers and we need lawyers who are really savvy around the use of data um, and so we need to start looking much more uh, sort of uh, cross fertilization in terms of the education and I know you know Jules here in Ireland you're involved with DCU and looking at some of their programs and, and trying to bring about, you know, much earlier on as part of the educational system, you know, having lawyers who understand much better 
uh, computer science and data schemas and all of that. And similarly then with um, the, the, the data scientists. And, and I think one of the really important things is, is that you know technologists when they're in a lab and they're about to release something have to be aware of some of the ramifications of what they're about to do technology for technology's sake is not a good idea and very often engineers think about only the foreseen consequences of what they do and not the unforeseen consequences so you know these are really broad questions that bring in not just technology but ethics and law as well so it, it's a really interesting area that's emerging i think and, and Eva, I know you're a lecturer on data protection at the Law Society of Ireland School of Law, as well as a lecturer on the Law Society's postgraduate courses. I mean, that educational piece, that cross fertilisation, education is such a big ship to steer, isn't it, anyway? So where are we picking it up? Schools, universities, anything younger? Are we asking too much of the education system? That they're always you know, yeah. well behind. Yeah, and I, I think, that, you know, particularly for lawyers, it's still too traditional in terms of how we train lawyers. You know, very often if I meet somebody who's interested in tech, I would sort of say, well, look, think about doing computer science and then become a lawyer or think about taking more modules around technology as well, because, you know, it's really something that you're going to have to get quite involved with and not be sort of, uh, you know, holding back from. And I think you know, there's areas now where we see privacy engineers emerging, and this is a really new area where sometimes they come from a legal background and then adopt the engineering approach, or sometimes they come from an engineering approach and start to adopt a more legal approach. But we really do need these hybrids, these rounded individuals who can understand it and see a much wider perspective from technology than, than just um, a, a, a more traditional either computer scientist approach or a legal approach. Great. I'm just very conscious that Ellen Daniel from Verdict has been waiting very patiently as well. Hello, Ellen. I'm, I'm putting the spotlight on you. I don't know if you want it or not. Would you like to ask the panel a question? I'd love you to. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the interesting discussion so far. Um, my question was um, about uh, data privacy regulation in the US specifically. Um, in the future, could we see um, more of an overarching regulation similar to GDPR introduced in the states? Or will it continue to be um, kind of the state specific regulation that's emerging at the moment? Great I'll question. Jump in then. We, we yes, absolutely please. will see, uh, perhaps in the next administration, um, the leading um, committee in Congress, the Commerce Committee, both the Democrats and Republicans have a bill. It's, it, there's a Democratic version and a Republican version. And it's not that different. We're actually not fighting about the substance. We're fighting about how to enforce it. Do we want private rights of action and you know collective action? Um, do we want um, it to fully preempt all the state laws? Probably not. We've got hundreds of state laws that protect your credit, that protect children. Um, we've got laws that already protect banking and health. So there, there are debates around how it would work with much of the other legislation, but there's probably 90% agreement. Um, uh, and, and much of this is driven by the fact that not only has California passed, the Washington, Washington state, you know, the home of Amazon and Microsoft and, and T-Mobile and, and uh, Expedia and the, is very far along on perhaps passing legislation. So there's immense pressure and both business and civil society and everyone in the legislative world supports it. But it took seven years to get GDPR done, right? Once everybody supported it, how do you get the details? So it's it's absolutely coming. Um, it's not going to happen before the election, no doubt. Um, but it's certainly uh, high on the agenda. Um, I, I say a year, year and a half, maybe two years um, to kind of fight out the details. But uh, it, it appears to be coming. And I think there's consensus. It's just a matter of how, how complicated and how soon. And um, will it include creating independent, you know, DPAs or will our Federal Trade Commission, you know, continue to be the lead enforcer? But but those are all the optics, right? I mean, they're important because the law can't get enforced unless you kind of have the right enforcement structure. But I think we're pretty clear. And, and GDPR clearly has been a big influence on that as well. A lot of companies are already complying with GDPR and are complying with much of the elements, but not all of GDPR in the U.S. So it's it's much less of a gap than it once was. And Ellen, do you want to ask another question on that? Well, um, no, that, that's answered my question already. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll maybe get some other comments from other people because I know obviously your publication covers global economics and business, including data driven news. Um, did anybody else want to comment on that, uh, Yokiko, from your point of view? 
on the US side of development or just generally yeah. on? Well, well, you can just add to the question if you want to. You don't have to. You can bat it to somebody else. Like crazy bumps, you can bat it upwards, sideways, along. I mean, I think George mentioned earlier about how the, diver the diversion requirements develop in, in different countries. That's like when he just was explaining that. I was like, that's my, my everyday life. And uh, um, so, you know, how do you keep track of, you know, there's one thing on the text, but another thing is the expectation from the local regulator if there is one set up already. So it's it's a really balancing act. And uh, but I have to say, I really enjoy my work. It's it's a really fun time to be in privacy. I will tell you. So definitely, in privacy is not dead. Yeah. Anybody That's else wants to comment on that? Eva, Morris, did you want to say anything on that question? You're quite happy with Jules' answer. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Aaron, just want to check, do we have anybody else that I've missed out in terms of questions? I think that's everything from, from the journalists there, unless they have any other questions that they want to ask. Yeah, anything else that you thought of, um, both Ellen and um, Jenny? No, I'm happy anyway. Thank you, Jenny. And Ellen, you're OK? I'm um, I'm Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm sure you can follow up after as well. Well, thank you so much for joining our virtual roundtable today. I don't know about you. Privacy is fun, isn't it? Not only is it not dead, it's fun as well. I think that, that's the title of uh, round two. I just want to thank all the panellists for their brilliant insights. I've thoroughly enjoyed this afternoon. Thank you very much to Aoife and Morris from Truata. And also a huge thank you to Yukiko from Mastercard and Jules as well from the Future of Privacy Forum. It's lovely to meet you all virtually. Hopefully we'll see each other one day in person. Until next time, thank you very much for your company and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.